Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is June 10th through the 16th, and we are talking about Alma 5 through 7. Now, in these chapters, we see Alma, and he's traveling city to city, and he's trying to bring people back into the church and get the church regulated and get things back on track. Now, one of the places he goes to is Zarahemla, and Zarahemla is struggling with some wickedness that is taking them away from the Lord. Now, this is one of those chapters when Alma is talking to these people in Zarahemla. This is one of those chapters that actually used to trouble me as a teenager and used to make me worry about my ability to go to Celestial Kingdom because I'd read these phrases about being stripped of pride and envy, which was very difficult as an insecure teenager, and walking blameless before God, and I just thought that there was no way I could stand a chance. Now, I don't think it's ever really a bad idea to consider this state of your soul. However, it has to be done right. So as I was a teenager and I was considering this black state of my soul and thinking I would never be good enough, (laughs) really all that that did So it didn't make me a better person. It was not helpful. Really, all it did is it would make me focus on myself more and be more selfish. So that's all super fun. And so there is a better way to do it. I was doing good things and trying to follow the Lord, but those good things were not changing me. And this was both unfortunate and ironic (laughs) since change was literally the entire point of the plan of salvation. It's not just doing good things, but it's being changed by those good things. Being changed to be a better person and a happier person. Both of those things were purposes of this change of heart, which was the purpose of the plan of salvation. So this change of heart, it obviously includes wanting to do what's right and to obey the Lord and to serve others. But there is more to that change of heart than just this incessant desire to just always do everything right and be perfect. There's a process to this change of heart. And I think sometimes this process gets a little knocked out of order (laughs) to our detriment. So I want to observe exactly what Alma is teaching about this change of heart because I feel like if we can observe exactly what Alma is teaching, we can be more prepared to meet our Heavenly Father. We can have our hearts changed. We become more capable of doing more good than we would otherwise be able to. And the process is fulfilling. It doesn't empty our souls and leave us feeling discouraged. It's fulfilling and it's a thrilling process. So As I said, Alma was addressing these saints in Zarahemla, and he's talking about, he brings up the captivity of their fathers. He's like, do you remember the captivity of your fathers, how they were encircled about by the bands of death and the chains of hell and everlasting destruction awaited them? All of these terrible things. And he says, were they destroyed? And Alma teaches, no, they weren't destroyed. Their bands were loosed. So here's a verse. It's Alma chapter 5, verse 10. It says, And now I ask of you, on what conditions are they saved? Yea, what grounds had they to hope for salvation? What is the cause of their being loosed from the bands of death, yea, and also the chains of hell? This is awesome because this is exactly what we're asking. How do we actually loose ourselves from not only sin, but all of the negative effects and feelings that come with sin. If we can learn how they escaped, because he's talking about their fathers, if we can learn how they escaped, we can learn how we're supposed to escape. So this is Alma, and it is chapter 5, verse 12. It says, and according to his faith, there is a mighty change wrought in his heart. Behold, I say unto you that this is all true. Being loosed from the bands of death and the everlasting destruction and all of these things didn't come from an incessant, bullheaded desire to do everything perfectly. (laughs) No, what came, what helped them be loosed from these bands 
there was faith and it wrought a change in their hearts. And there's a place for works and we will talk about works. But it was faith that loosed the bands and brought the mighty change of heart. I think sometimes in our culture, (laughs) we profess grace and we believe that the Savior paid for our sins. But (laughs) when we are actually, I guess, faced with that concept that the Savior took care of our sins and got rid of it, we almost inwardly scoff a little. So I grew up in Texas and I grew up around a lot of Texas Christians, which, and these Christians believe that they're that there were no works, like you didn't have to do any works, it didn't matter what you did in life, if you believed in Christ, you were saved. And though I believe there is a place for works, maybe there was something that they were onto. I think sometimes we're afraid that if we lean too much into faith, if we lean too much into grace and the Savior's ability to pay for our mistakes, we're going to relinquish our responsibility and we are going to find ourselves in trouble. So we profess grace, but our thoughts about whether we're worthy and the fact that we beat ourselves up does not reflect a belief in Christ. It does not reflect a belief in grace. But here it is, Alma teaching it again. It is faith that wrought the mighty change and loosed their bands. So I want to talk about grace and works again. (laughs) And I know that I talk about grace and works a lot, but grace and works, that relationship between the two is extremely complex. There's lots of layers to it. There's so many ways to teach the relationship between the two and not a single one of them teaches the entire relationship. So here is another way, another context, another layer in which we can learn about the relationship between grace and works to add to the understanding that we've already acquired. So in the beginning of the video, I talked about how there is a process to our change of heart because it's the change of heart that looses the bands. I talked about how there's a process to this change of heart and how sometimes it would get knocked out of order to our detriment. So the first method to work towards a change of heart that I want to talk about is a works first kind of method where we do everything we can to be perfect and obey and check off all the lists and we believe that those good feelings in the faith it just kind of descends later (laughs) i tried that and it didn't really descend we think if we follow everything perfectly that eventually those good feelings are just going to kind of show up but it doesn't happen like that now i want to give a quick disclaimer we will be perfect someday that day is not today not in this environment. Someday we'll never have to fall again, but that's not going to happen here. Our Heavenly Father (laughs) set us up to fail. And not because He doesn't love us, but because He loves us. He had to. It was the only way that we could grow to become like Him. He had to place us In order for us to really get that growth, He had to place us in an environment where there was enough opposition to fight against so we could get that growth. But the flip side of that coin of being placed in this environment of opposition meant that we are going to fail repeatedly all the time. (laughs) Okay. So he set us up to fail. He placed us in this environment where we could grow. He placed it here because he wanted us to grow. But he also knew that placing us here meant we were going to fail repeatedly and fall down hard a lot. So he placed us here to fail for good reason. And then he sent his son to pay for the whole experience so that we could get that growth and the falling down repeatedly wasn't going to keep us from returning. So we understand that there's a purpose. There's a purpose we are placed on this earth in all of this opposition with weak mortal bodies. <laughs> but with this work, works first based method, Your goal is to stop falling. That's your goal. In a works first method, you are trying to stop falling. But when we look at the context of the plan of salvation, we understand why we came to earth and we understand why we were placed in this opposition. We learn (laughs) that we should stop trying 
to stop falling. So I'm going to say that again. We need to stop trying to stop falling. That should not be our goal. When we do a works first method, we're placing all of our hopes on this idea that we're not going to fall again. We're never going to fail again. And that's how we're going to get home. And in order to get home, we have to stop falling and we have to overcome all these flaws. And maybe we don't phrase that, but we that's kind of how our actions show. That's how we feel internally and the actions come out that way. That's why we beat ourselves up over mistakes or when we don't overcome our flaws fast enough. That's why we get discouraged and wonder whether we're ever going to be good enough. And it's because we have this belief, even if we don't say it out loud, we have this belief that we have to stop failing in order to go home. But we know that there was a purpose for why we needed to come here and fail. We know that there was purpose in this. We know that there was purpose in weakness and opposition. In a works first method, we're putting our faith in ourselves, not the Savior. We are putting our faith in us. We claim to believe that we believe that the Savior saved us and we believe in his grace. But if we really believe in his grace, joy comes, joy follows. When we do works first, we're trying desperately to use our own abilities to stop failing and it's not going to work. We're just going to get discouraged and eventually we're going to give up. That's what happens with a works first method. When we put works first in this order of trying to get our hearts to change. So second method. Second method is a faith first model. It's a faith faith first method. Sorry, tongue twister. So people scoff at me when I say to stop trying to stop failing. I'm not telling you to stop striving. That's not what I'm saying. Stop trying to stop failing is not the same as stop striving. What I am telling you to do is to change your goal. A faith first method is much more effective. (laughs) It works way, 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 way better. A works first and a faith first method have the same goal, but they have wildly different approaches and only one is effective and that is the faith first method. I truly believe that, that the faith first method is the only way that we're really going to achieve this eventual perfection and salvation and all the feelings that come associated with salvation. It's only going to happen with faith first. When we have the faith first method, we know that trusting Christ is the only way to salvation. We stop trying to stop failing and we shift our focus. Instead of trying to do everything perfectly, we shift our focus. We have this broad understanding that we came to earth to fail. Well, we came to earth to grow and failing was just kind of an inevitable consequence. But we also know that the Savior paid for it. So we stop trying to stop failing and instead we focus on collecting strength and experience and lessons from each of those times that we fall. And we trust that Christ paid the price for us to gain this experience. So we shift our focus and we're like, okay, I, it's not about whether I'm falling. It's about whether I am gaining the experience, which is the whole reason I came to earth. And I am simultaneously trusting these failings aren't eating at me and making me want to give up because I simultaneously trust that Christ paid the price so that I could gain the experience, that that was the plan the whole time, (laughs) was that he would pay so that I could gain this experience. When we switch our focus from never failing to collecting strength and experience and to magnifying our gratitude for the Savior, when we shift our focus to that collecting strength and gratitude, that's when your heart changes. That's when you find happiness. That's when you find all the feelings that were promised with salvation, the peace and the joy and the comfort and the belief in the happy ending. It's when we have shifted to believe that the Savior set us up for success, that even though we would fail over and over and over again, 
Success means collecting strength and experience, which is exactly what we're doing, and that he paid for everything. That's when you experience that happiness and your heart changes. I fail all the time, (laughs) especially when I'm pregnant and angry. So I am not a perfect mom. I am definitely not a perfect wife. I get angry with my kids. I get angry when I'm wronged. (laughs) I can be vain and selfish and I can hold a grudge, but I'm trying. And I believe that he loves me, that he adores me. I believe that he believes in me. And because I feel all the good feelings that comes with that faith in him, Because I have faith that he believes in me, I receive those feelings of salvation, the peace and the joy, and I change. My heart changes, and I want to be good. I have no more disposition to do evil. I don't want to be, I don't want to do wrong. It's hard to want to do wrong. (laughs) when you're faced with the reality of your Savior's love. When you're feeling that on a regular basis and it's changing your heart, it is much easier to do good. So I want to talk about this faith for just a second. And I want to separate faith into two categories so I can really hit this point home. So we have faith in the form of obedience. When you believe in the Savior, you know you should probably follow him. It's probably a good idea. So faith in the form of obedience. But we also have faith in the form of trusting the Savior. Both are action words. I have had to choose to trust the Savior as much as I have ever had to choose to obey the Savior. I had to choose to trust him just like I chose to obey him. When we try to obey Without choosing to trust, it's awful. (laughs) It sucks to live the gospel like that. It's not fun. It's miserable. And it's inefficient. And it doesn't work that well. (laughs) Okay? Eventually, you just get discouraged and you want to give up. I think sometimes we're afraid to let go of nagging ourselves into perfection because we're worried that we'll become comfortable in sin. And then we'll really find ourselves in trouble. But that's not what happens. I used to be afraid. I used to be afraid that if I let go of my perfectionism and my incessant need to do everything right, that I would get too comfortable in sin and I would just stay there and never get better because I didn't have this incessant need to be perfect. That's not what happens. (laughs) When we let go of our own nagging and we embrace the Savior and we embrace faith in him, we trust him, we trust what he says, that he paid for this, that he really, he just sent us here to gain experience (laughs) and learn. (laughs) You find a much deeper motivation than perfectionism. A much deeper motivation. You want to be stripped of envy and pride? (laughs) Experience his love and you won't feel a need to compare yourself to anybody. It just kind of melts away. Embrace the Savior embrace faith and trust in him. It is the only happy and effective way to live the gospel. I know that faith in the Savior, in the form of trusting the Savior, has changed my heart and made me a way, way better person than when I was trying to do everything perfectly, when my goal was to stop falling which is so funny (laughs) when I chose to let go of that and instead to trust the savior, I became so much better because his love changed my heart. And I testify that that process is real and happy and effective and fulfilling. And it brings you all the blessings, all the blessings that the gospel has promised to bring. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.